Your resume is all about who you used to be, right? Your LinkedIn profile should be projecting your brand into the future. It should be talking about the person you're becoming, like dress for the job you want, right? It's it's about showing forward thinking, what's happening, what, what you're moving towards. Not making stuff up, right? But but owning what you've done and really like looking forward to what's ahead. And that I think is the sweet spot for most companies. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Karen. Karen, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm so happy to be here, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So give us a highlight of who you are and what you do for work. Yeah. So uh, my name is Karen Yankovich. And um, fundamentally, what I do is I support women with LinkedIn and PR. And really what that what that boils down to is supporting them with their brands, right? Helping women really dive into and get clear on the brand of them and really show up and elevate themselves and their brands so that, you know, I, my goal, I want there to be more wealthy women in the world. And I think it starts with, we. it starts inside of us, right? We have to, we have to feel worthy of it so that we can, and we have to show the world how great we are so that we can operate from that place. So my entire business is, is focused on that. I am the host of, of my own podcast called Good Girls Get Rich, which, um, and you oh, know, the so- whole goal of that same thing, what, what do we need to do to think differently, think bigger and show up and have more wealthy women in the world? Okay. I love you already. And this is going to be like a total uh, bromance. (laughs) Uh, Awesome. So how did you get into LinkedIn as a thing and helping women in businesses? Yeah. So you know what? My background, listen, I'm a little older than social media. So my background is in sales, relationship (laughs) marketing. I've always done sales. And when, you know, in the early, like maybe 2010 ish, I started doing, um, more online marketing, learning more about the online marketing world. And I was, I had an agency where we were really helping people with all the things, all the platforms, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, which was completely overwhelming um, to to be an expert at all things. But what I was doing, because my, my, you know, when I, prior to this, my, my, I grew up in the world of sales in the IT world. And back in, you know, the around 2000s, maybe. So very often I was the only woman in the room. So I had to portray confidence because otherwise I would never get a word in edgewise, right? I had to make sure everybody in that room knew that I knew my stuff. So when I started to help other people with their brands, I kind of kept migrating them to LinkedIn because I wanted to make sure that, because what I re- what I knew was that as much as we care about the brand of the business, as the years went on, we care more and more about the people behind the business. And if the pe- if the brand of all the people in the business is strong, it immediately elevated the business brand. So I started, so even though I was kind of doing social media in general, I was really driving everybody to LinkedIn. And, and I started being asked to speak on LinkedIn all over the world. And I started to get, that started to be more of my niche. And then I had a little shiny object syndrome for a while and partnered on a partner with a woman that does PR. And we started doing like social media and PR stuff. And then really where that landed for me ultimately was LinkedIn and PR because, because it, it, I, I, I think that when your personal brand is strong and you're shining a light on that, people see you differently and no one's going to think you're better than you say you are, right? So all of those years of working in IT and really having to shine a light on me made me realize that your personal brand and how you talk about yourself and how you think about yourself is important toward, towards your success, right? And and so initially I wasn't really focusing on women, but then I started my podcast a few years ago, really wanting to help women with this because I think that women need more help with than men. We say things like, I got it. I got it. We don't say nobody does this better than me. We say, I got it. Just give it to me. I'll take care of it. We need to tell people how good we are. And when people Google us and they are Googling us now, we can control what comes up. And that starts with your LinkedIn profile, right? So, so I started to shift. I, my program was initially called get linked up and I, I, I still serve men. I don't care really what your body parts are or how you identify. (laughs) I just think women need to feel more included in on LinkedIn. So I really put a, a, a focus on supporting women so that they feel like they're at home. And then it really comes down to the people in your life. Are you building relationships on a micro-targeted level with the kinds of people that you need to be building relationships with that can change your business and your life and your bank balance? And right. that's the that's the strategy behind all of this. 
And you had like 28 comments and I'm like, oh, and we could have a whole conversation on that and that. I know, right? I know, I know. Well, and I'm just going to dive a little bit into the PR piece because the other thing is too, Mm -hmm. when we're building relationships on LinkedIn or wherever, right? I like like to focus on three different types of relationships. One, obviously, who's going to buy your stuff, but nobody really likes to have those conversations, right? Like, here's my, my name's Karen. Give me your credit card, right? So this, the other two types are like, who else serves your audience and are you building relationships with them? But then also who writes about and talks about what you are an expert in? Because when you start to build relationships with the journalists and the podcast hosts and the TV hosts and the magazine writers, and you they start quoting you as an expert in your industry, it immediately gives you credibility. And especially as women, you know, we've heard for so many years about the glass ceiling and we can only get so far. We can kind of like go right around the grass, glass ceiling now and be the ones featured in the newspapers and the magazines. And 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 if our current endeavors are not what we want them to be and are not elevating us to where we want to be, somebody else will. Somebody else will. And we can control that now, which I think is pretty exciting. I love it. Well, I, I've never myself known as a glass ceiling, but I've never worked in corporate really either. <laughs> but but I have noticed that if you say something with enough confidence that people will believe you, uh, well, believe me. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think there is a little nuance there that a lot of women just don't get. You said nobody will ever think more highly of you than you promote yourself to be. And I think that's so true. And so many women just don't recognize that that's why they have to at least get somebody else to write the accolades for them. And I think also that guys tend to go after, you know, I want first prize in this, I want first prize in that. And they have the trophy walls. So they know what people respect as a trophy wall. Whereas women kind of go, I just want to be a really good swimmer. I just really want to be a- (laughs) Right, that's exactly right. And the accolade thing just, it doesn't jive with them. So how do you do PR? How do you get a brand? How do you boast yourself about how great you are when you're like, I don't know. I just do stuff and I get it done. They get it done right. What? <laughs> That's exactly right. And and it, here's the thing. This is this can be simple. And I'm and I'm not saying it's easy. I know it's a, there's a strategy behind all of it, but it's not like nobody's asking you. To, I'm certainly not asking you to hustle, right? <laughs> I'm saying you know go to your local newspaper, type in the word like for me. I'll type in the word LinkedIn, and I'll see who's talking about or marketing, and I'll see who's talking about it, and then I'll go to the journalist that's writing the article. And I'm like, you know what? I want to make sure they know who I am. So I'll start sharing their stuff or maybe even offer to buy them coffee or see if there's a, like, you know, build relationships with with the speakers at the conferences that you go to. When you do this from LinkedIn and you've done it from a place where your profile's awesome, it's, it immediately gives you, all you have to do then is the outreach and say, hey, you know, I, I see you're going to be speaking at this event or I just read your article. Like who doesn't want to talk to people that, that read their articles or are listening to their talks or their podcasts, right? I mean, you're a podcast host. I wish I could tell you that I wake up every morning and 50 people say, I listened to your show and it was great. It doesn't happen as often as I would like, right? So when people do, I remember them. And it's just a way to start building relationships. And women are good at that. We just have mm-hmm. to apply that to our businesses. Nice. Love that. So you mentioned also the the difference between branding a business and branding a personality and how that is becoming more of the thing, regardless if you're the head of a company. Um, in the long run, kind of let's stretch it out for one second. Does it make a big difference on sellability of a business that you've personally branded it? Or does the business eventually morph into that personality and you're, you're buying that personality because it affects your hiring and your marketing and the whole nine yards? That's a really interesting question. Um, that's a really interesting <laughs> like, question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I here's the thing. You know, like if you think about, let's just say there's a company that you're looking that, that let's say you're company A and you want company B to hire your co- company A to do something, right? Yep. If they come to your LinkedIn company page or even your website, and you've got the board of directors or whatever on your website, and you got their LinkedIn profiles on there. And every time you click through it, everybody you click through looks like a rock star, right? It it gives you confidence in the company. It's not that you're not going to hire them if you don't have that information, but we have the ability to do this now. So I think that, I think that, um, it's a mindset. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a, the energy, the company, the, what's the word? Um, it's almost like the, the company practice, right? If the company says, I, we invest 
in making sure everyone that works here for us has everything they need and shows up like a rock star. That immediately makes that company, I think, more valuable. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of companies that still look at LinkedIn and say, well, I'm not going to do their profiles. We're just going to go out and get another job then, right? That's not the right mind. That's not a forward thinking mindset. Yeah, no. I think companies <laughs> that embrace the brands of the people that work for them, right down to like, imagine if you're like the administrative assistant for the CEO and you have a great LinkedIn profile. And every time someone calls to connect, you have to connect them to your boss. You connect with them on LinkedIn and said, you know, and, and they see that you're amazing. Imagine if you're the bookkeeper and you have a great profile and you've got to do um, collections, right? You're going to do a better job at it. If you have, if you've personally connected with the people that you talk to on a regular basis, right? So, so I think that the company's value is going to be higher when they invest in the people and the brands of the people and therefore how could it not be a more valuable company when somebody else is looking at it from a valuation standpoint right i don't know that i can directly equate those but i gotta <laughs> believe that it happens all, all good because it brought up good conversation in that i think the trend is going to me clearly from competition to collaboration like i see people go all the time well we can't invite these people because they're your competition i'm like nobody's my competition <laughs> Right. don't That's understand exactly that right. i get the majority of my clients from my so-called competition so i actually prefer to be in a room of this if you could not make those decisions for me that'd be great uh, and and when i go on to somebody's site and they have that uh collective spirit if you will within their board of directors on their linkedins i go wow this is a company that unites their employees the team that they have a direction they have a mission they have a vision everybody's on board with it and they're not isolating people because of it and yeah. i think that makes it even more powerful to see and to your point then it becomes it's not just about your personality it's about what are you creating and and the legacy that you're going to leave which right. then allows women to see hey this isn't about you standing up on a pedestal and going rah rah this has been by i'm all out in a bag of Yep. Chips. It's it's who how do we want our employees to feel? How do we want our clients to feel? How do we want the world around us to feel knowing yes. that we're doing these things in this way? And I think that's becoming more and more important from you know, our branding to our packaging to our logistics to our everything. Well, and I think in this post-pandemic world, if that's what we're in right now, right. um, I think <laughs> I think that we now realize that virtual is here to stay. It doesn't mean we're not going to be in person, but but our brands, our, our, our digital brands are more important than they've ever been. I mean, when we're in a Zoom meeting, at least when I'm in a Zoom meeting, I'm looking up people, which you can't do if you're in an important in-person meeting, right? I'm checking out their LinkedIn profiles. I'm checking out who they are. Like I was in a meeting yesterday and I had three LinkedIn connection requests sent out before the meeting ended. You know, that's happening now. So- mm -hmm. So you don't have to do this, but if you are doing it, you're ahead of the curve. You're, you, you know, you're going to be, people are going to have more confidence in you and in your business in the people that work for your business. And I think, I think all the way around, it's a benefit to, to the businesses. And, and you said one thing that I want to, I want to talk about. It's not about bragging or saying, I'm so great. It's about owning your degrees, your accomplishments, you know, the, the change that you make in the world. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot with LinkedIn profiles is your LinkedIn, pro your resume is all about who you used to be. Right. Your LinkedIn profile should be projecting your brand into the future. It should be talking about the person you're becoming, like dress for the job you want. Right. It's it's about showing forward thinking what's happening, what, what you're moving towards, not making stuff up. Right. But but owning what you've done and really like looking forward to what's ahead. And that, I think, is the sweet spot for most companies when they're creating their digital brands. Nice. I'm loving that. And I think some people may find it even easier to be able to be forward focused and say, here's what we're working towards. Here's our our ambition, our missions, our you know, how we want to come across. And I think it's it should be fairly easy to say, hey, this is my <laughs> This is our anticipation of where we're going um, because it, one, it, it's easy to say we're going to do this as opposed to we've done this or we're doing this. And two, it gives us a little bit more ability to be, um, to see the opportunity or I was, wanted to say opportunistic, but that wasn't really the word I meant. Um, but to focus on, yeah, I have these accolades and this is what I'm using it for. As opposed right. to, I have these accolades, which for some people is hard to say. 
right? Like I've done this and now I want to do this and, yeah. you know, and, and almost building on like the story of you, right? So rather than it being your resume, it's almost like the story of you. And now you're writing the next chapter. Nice. and love that. So other than kind of downplaying themselves, what are some of the bigger mistakes that women are making, especially on the LinkedIn profiles, especially when they happen to be, you know, the C-suite or the, the founders of the companies? Yeah, well, first of all, remembering that nobody really cares about you, right? <laughs> they care about what you are, can do yeah. for them. So yeah. making your profile client facing, if you will, right? Instead yeah. of saying, you know, you can say, um, you know, like, again, not like a resume, right? Like nobody cares whether you know Word or Excel. No, and you don't, and there's no LinkedIn police. I don't want you to make stuff up, but think back to like, for example, when I was, um, you know, in still in tech, I owned a company and I did, I own the company. I did everything. We had like 10 people that were for us. So I hired people. I fired people. I bought office furniture. I went out on sales calls, right? If what I'm doing now is human resources related, I would be talking in that experience on my LinkedIn profile about benefits and picking benefits and things like that. But it's so not relevant to what I do now that I don't even talk about it. I just talk about in the previous experiences, I only talk about the things that brought me to where I am today, right? So you don't have to say, and I got this certification as a project manager. I mean, if you if it's going to add to your brand, by all means, add it. But mm -hmm. you don't have to put, I and I'm certified in Excel, if, especially if you ever want to do Excel again, right? right? Like, so, so don't think about it. Like, it's not like there's a LinkedIn police that's going to fact check everything. I don't want you to make things up, but you can recreate things. Like another example could be that your title, right? Like the, that same, there was another company I worked for. I think when I left there, I don't remember what my title was, but it was not. Um, I, I think I have director of sales and marketing as my title at that company. I was the director of sales and marketing at one point, but sales and marketing are keywords for me now. So that's how I've recreated that role. It's true, but there, I probably don't have a business card that says that, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so it's not about, I want you to be authentic, but realize that you don't have to be like, like so many women think, well, that's, I have to, th th I have to do it by the book and it is by the book, but do it in a way that shines a light, mostly on, it shines a light on you. Right. And the other thing that I will say to women too, is if it feels really easy to push save, you probably have not done enough to tell the world how great you are. Right. So I want you to be in that place where you're like, can I really say that about myself? Like, what if my sister sees this or what if my neighbor sees this? What are they going to think about me saying that I am the like, that's where I want you to be. And you can change it if in a couple months you decide you don't like it. Um, the other thing is. Don't be afraid to niche down and don't be afraid to be different. Um, and, you know, an example that I like to use, and I don't know that I've ever gotten anybody to take me up on this, is real estate agents, right? They're all, they all say the same thing. And every town you go to has 50 real estate agents. They have so much competition everywhere you go. If you are a sage waving, Reiki symbol painting, St. Joseph burying upside down person, put that in your LinkedIn profile. Tell me you're going to feng shui my living room before you sell my house, because that's going to make you stand out from all of the other realtors in your, in your area. It doesn't mean you're not going to get business. There may be people that say, oh, she's nuts. I would never hire her, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going, oh no, no, bring it on, bring it on. I want that feng shui magic in my house before I sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to tell, to, to show what makes you different, what makes you stand out because it is not like even using myself as an example, when I was a social media agent owner, agency owner, and somebody needed a social media speaker, my name would get thrown out with a hundred other people, you know, you, you know, a hundred people. And my name was in those hundred. Now, when somebody needs a LinkedIn speaker, 25 people say, call Karen. And if somebody needs a LinkedIn speaker at a women's conference, 125 people say, call Karen, right? So the more you niche, the more opportunities you're going to get that you love to do. Now, I would say I have a podcast called good girls get rich. My program is called she's linked up. I'm going to say half of my private clients are men. It doesn't mean you're not going to get that other business, but you're going to get known for what you do. So don't be afraid to show what makes you different when you're writing your LinkedIn profile. Awesome. I love that. Well, and I have a podcast called Bad, Bad Girls on Business. So we might have to coordinate. Oh, <laughs> I, I, feel like I, I feel like we have a, yeah, like a challenge coming up or something. Exactly. I don't know what to do with that. That'll be fun. 
So when it comes to building a million dollar business, I know a lot of people struggle at kind of that three, 400,000 range. And they're like, oh, break it. And I keep going, you know, unique, unique, unique. What is unique about you? And a lot of people don't realize if they feng shui their real estate business, that that allows them to then charge more money because they're not just selling a house, yes. they're adding an added service on top of that. Yes. So you get three clients that are like, yes, and wait, because of that, you get those testimonials, you then up your feet, or how do you recommend that they, that they do that? Like, how do they see themselves as then stepping away from uh, the norm? Yeah, well, I think it comes down to pricing. I think initially anyway, not fully, but pricing is a big piece of it. I think many women look around and say, well, everybody else charges this, so I can't charge more. I am not looking for people to overcharge, but I want you to understand that if I say to you, I got $10,000 in my hand, I want to give it to you. What can you do for me? Like dream big. What can you do for me for that $10,000? Right? Like, and just, you know, like I... It doesn't matter what the industry is. I can help them figure out what their high ticket offer is. And 10,000 might not even be the high ticket, right? So, so many women, especially, they, they and especially when I talk, you know, I talk to them like, well, I want to build this group program. And I'm like, do you know how many people you have to have in your audience to make any real money on a group program, at least out of the gate? Start, you know, like flip it. You know, I almost say, I almost want to say, just double your prices. Like before you do another thing, double your prices. And it's, and again, I don't want you to think about overcharging, but remember this, if you are bringing in enough money that your cup is overflowing, you can serve those people that can't afford you with that overflow. So don't worry about the people that can't afford your high ticket. Think about the people that you are going to way over serve. The world we live in right now, people pay for fast action. They'll pay for your attention. They'll pay for spending one-on-one -on -one time with you and they'll pay well. There's people that will pay well for that. Look for those opportunities, build your business there, and then hire people to help you do the things that you're that are not your zone of genius and maybe get your audience bigger so that you then can do the things that you can leverage, like a group program and things like that. But so many people think they want to start that first. And I want you to think about the high ticket opportunities first. The first thing I do when I work with people on every level is say, what is your target? And that target needs to be at least a five or ten thousand um, dollar package because I'm not looking for you to send out 50,000 LinkedIn connection requests. I want you to talk to people and there needs to be a big enough payoff on the other side for that to be worth your time, right? You know, I think about one of my clients, um, Claire, if, if you're listening, um, Claire and I had a conversation and she said that first call where I'm like, we need to come up with that big package. She serves corporate and she's like, I know I was thinking 5,000, but I know you're going to want it to be 10,000. So let's just go with 10,000. So we talked about this $10,000 package. And then before we finished, I said, what if it was 20,000? And she said, oh my gosh, well, then I could go on site once a month. I could do pro personality assessments. I could do, I'm like, doesn't that sound amazing? Like, doesn't, don't you think your, cl your prospective clients are going to want all of that? Right? Like, so we just, we need to think bigger. And I think that is the biggest challenge mm -hmm. to get you from six figures to seven figures is that this is your mindset is thinking bigger. Um, the other thing too, is we've got our energy, our aspirations are here, but sometimes our energy is still here. Our energy has got to match our aspirations. You know, we've got to be feeling and thinking and breathing and smelling and tasting and touching like seven figure business owners, if we want to really experience it. Mm -hmm. No, but what, and I've noticed one thing when you're mentioning the pricing thing is that a lot of women tend to start low and go, oh yeah, and I can do that too. And I can do that too. And I can do that too. And it becomes that and $5 and $5 and $5, which kills us. We'd rather start, you know, at the big one and go, ah, oh, it's kind of out of my budget. What do you, what can you do for less than that? Right. Why do we, so many women, in your opinion, start at the low one and think that they can go up when in fact, it's so much easier to do the other way around. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, not only that, like it's, it's sales is often one of the hardest things for many women to kind of embrace. You don't have to have as many sales to get where you want to be. And, you know, so, and then you can maybe even hire salespeople at some point because you've got enough cash coming in. So, so I don't know, but I think, I think it's, I think it's back to that energy thing. You know, men think like CEOs, women just don't as often. And I'm not bashing men at all. I mean, we need to think more like CEOs, right? So right. 
I just think we don't, you know, I mean, I, another issue that's come up lately, and I'd love to hear, I'm here, I'm interviewing you now, but I love to hear <laughs> about this is like women go into this, especially coaches and consultants and real estate agents, and they go into it and they're like, and I'm making 50K months or 100K months and that's good, but they don't have an exit plan. Men are selling businesses for $10 million. Do you know what I mean? Why are we not doing that? Right. Like so many women don't have that exit plan in mind when they're when they're building. It doesn't mean you have to sell your business. Right. But we look at it as a passion project. Exactly. (laughs) Women tend to look at their business as a passion project. And it's my baby and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to call it and coddle it. And I'm going to be here for 18 years while it grows up. And guys are like, how do I make money and make it now? (laughs) Right. <laughs> that's like right. oh, okay here by my baby yeah. and i'm not saying that that's what they're doing at all but that's right. almost how women perceive it and it's like no it's just a business it's just an idea it's okay to sell your ideas your ideas are right. awesome and 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 a lot of people want those ideas because a good idea is a good commodity right and maybe it's just the the hanging around people that talk finances and that that engage in these conversations and you start to hear things differently. Cause I know even since I started podcasting, I've been going, Hey, you can make a million dollars. You can make a million dollars. You can make a million dollars. And now I'm going like, you could make a hundred million. <laughs> like, oh, right. uh, should we be having that conversation instead? Cause this one's kind of, you know, right. well, I do think it's shifting. Don't you think it's starting to shift us. though? Like, right? I think people like you and maybe like me, I think we're shifting the narrative a little bit. And that's pretty exciting. I think more that's women true. are starting to think more like business owners and, you know, um, I think it's shifting. It's got a long way to go, but I think it's shifting and um, it's pretty exciting to watch. Thanks. I love it. So what are some of the things that if you, uh, one that you would have done differently, if knowing now what you know now, what would you have done differently and or um, if you're, if you were to start your business with all of today's amenities, what would you use to make it work faster, better? Yeah. I mean, I think when I started my business, I did all the things Google and my digital marketing Connection. coaches told me to do, you know, I built an email list, which I still think you need to do, but I built an email list and I had funnels and I had a $5 thing and a $10 thing and a $20 thing. And, you know, um, you know, I think what I had going for me was when I started this variation of my business. I was actually still, I I had, when I sold my company that I was talking about earlier, I went to work for one of my clients uh, part-time and then it became full-time. So I was actually working. So I I was running this agency and paying people to do everything because I didn't have a lot of time. Because of that, my prices were high because I'm like, well, I got to make, I'm not doing this if I'm not making any money. So I've got to pay them. I want to have good people. So I started with higher pricing stuff, but I did so much stuff that I just didn't need to do. And, and again, I started with, I need to do everything and I need to, you know, I need to serve everyone. And, if, and, and talk about like, one of the things you mentioned where it's like another $5, another $5, another $5. I wish I was smart enough to charge $5. I was just doing things. And then I was, you know, and like, I was like, how am I in charge? Like, wait, I told them I'd put their blog on their website. Now I'm in charge of their website, you know, just because I t- I said I would do their news. Like, so, so I was doing too much and I didn't hold firm in my expertise. Um, and I wasn't confident enough in my own self to, to, to charge the high ticket things. I, I, even now, like a couple of years ago, um, one of my salespeople called me and she's like, I need a, um, you know, I need a, a, an invoice thing for like $50,000. I'm like, what am I giving him a kid? What am I doing for $50,000? And she's telling me, and I'm like, you sold that for $50,000. And she's like, yes, you need to, you're doing this, this. I'm like, okay. You know, and you know what? It was amazing because I had the budget to so over deliver to these people, you know, but even, so even, you know, there's always another level of like, I will, and it's identity, right? Like it's always another identity level we have to go up. So I think, I mean, if I could tell myself back, I'd be like, don't be afraid to throw out the big numbers and then understand that you're going to be given this amazing value for that. Nice. Um, well, and I, I love the idea the of over thing. delivering on something when, if you feel like you've oversold and like, oh, I don't know, you can, you can totally oversell because it's so much easier yeah. to do than when somebody says, oh, and can you do this? And can you do that? And can you do this? And, you, and you're going, well, I can, but I'm not charging you for it yet. So we're going to have to charge right. you more and that's, for it. And those are uncomfortable. Those are the conversations I don't want to have. <laughs> Hey, I mean, I want to have the conversations where like, you know what? I got a great idea. Let me bring in a PR expert and let me, you know, let me do this. And I've got this person I'm going to bring on board to this little project. I want to be able to do that. 
love that idea. That is awesome. So what are some of the stumbling blocks that somebody might be having right now? And they're going, oh my God, Karen, I need you so badly. You know what? I mean, Google yourself. <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> Would you hire you? I mean, uh, like, and, and, and it really, I mean, we can very simply overcome a lot of that with just your LinkedIn profile. I don't want it to be just your LinkedIn profile, but if you put my name into a Google search, 10 pages come up and it's because of the PR piece of it. And that gives you credibility. So many women that I work with are one of the stumbling blocks that they have is they have imposter syndrome, right? Well, I've been working, um, maybe they were in corporate and they were making $200,000 as a, you know, C, a C suite in a C suite. And they decide they want to be a consultant. And, but they've only been a consultant for a minute. Well, they've have they've got the expertise, right? What the PR does is it gives them, helps them with that credibility. It helps them with that identity so that when they start to get quoted as the expert. So, and it's not hard to get PR. Journalists need us. They need us. So, so understand that even if you don't feel like you have the experience, if you have the expertise, you have to get over yourself with the imposter syndrome and, and just try it, just try it, just see how it feels when you just really shine a light on, on all the accomplishes, accomplishments you have, and then, and then build a business from there. And I know if you're listening, you've probably seen that consultant that came to your company and they were paying them $500 an hour or $5,000 an hour. And you were like, what? right? Be that consultant, be that <laughs> consultant that the people in the, in the company are like, how much are we paying that consultant? Right. You're worth it because you're not an employee. You're paying your own benefits. You're paying your own overhead. You're paying your own taxes. You know, it's not all going in your, we all know it's not all going in our pockets, you well, know, exactly. so, and they're not paying you for the moment you're in their office or during that call. Right. It's all the work that you're doing afterwards and <laughs> the support that right. you have in order to put that in place. And, right. and, 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 yeah. So you have to shot, you have to, Really just close your eyes, hold your nose and jump and show the world, tell the world how great you are. And I'm telling you, people will see you differently. You know, I, I this morning I had a doctor's appointment and the woman came in to take your blood, blood pressure. And somehow we got on the, I don't know how I get in these conversations with the blood pressure technician, but she was <laughs> saying, I told my son, people treat you the way you're dressed. I'm like, amen, sister, like, amen. And this was like, that's the same kind of thing. People will treat you how you show up. You've got to do that's on you to show up looking like you're worthy of their money. Right. So I love that. And for those who don't know kind of the changes in PR and directions, can you just kind of iterate on what PR means today as opposed to what it was? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ago, so, so listen, you can still hire a ten thousand dollar month PR agency and and people do and and they're, and they're amazing. I'm not saying don't do that. But until you do that, I'll give you an example, a, a real life example. I have a client who's a realtor in Washington State. And um, saw an article about about real estate in on NBC, and and she connected with the journal had a great LinkedIn profile, connected with the, the person that wrote the article, shared the article, said this is a great article, blah blah blah. Again, doesn't happen as often as you would think. So the journalist said thank you so much for sharing this, and then a week later, read, reached back out and said, can I ask you a few questions? turned into a full page article on NBCnews.com about housing prices. Like all she did was say, can I, you know, all she did was share the article and, but the piece that was missing that most people don't do is and connected with the writer mm -hmm. and tagged the writer and stroked the writer a little bit. Right now of all the realtors in that local market, she's the only one that says as seen on NBC legitimately in her profile. Right. And it was as simple as just doing that. So that's what I mean. It's not these big, complicated pitch yourself things. It's about building authentic relationships with the journalist. I met a guy in New Jersey. I live in New Jersey. I met a guy who runs one of the biggest newspapers in New Jersey at a conference. And a couple of years ago, I see an article that our governor was interviewing Gary Vaynerchuk, who also lives in New Jersey, about digital marketing in New Jersey. So I Mess, I emailed the guy. I'm like, we need to get in on this digital marketing thing in New Jersey. We need to do LinkedIn workshops for the people of New Jersey. He's like, you're right. Come on in. Let's talk about it. Right. Like it wasn't like, it wasn't like, I didn't do this big pitch. It was just like a fun little conversation. Right. I ended up doing it. This was like January of 2020. So clearly we didn't do the in-person workshops, but it, we ended up doing a virtual workshop for the entire, like there was like 2000 people on this virtual workshop because it was, you know, it happened during the pandemic, but it came just from me meeting this guy at a conference and building an actual relationship with him. 
you know, and not, I didn't even, never even met the guy. I don't even know if you remembered who I was, right? But I had a great LinkedIn profile and I reached out and said, did you see this article? We need to get in on this. And he's like, yeah, I like that idea. Come on in, let's talk about it, right? So it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It just needs, just, just understand that journalists are people like you and me, and they need ideas and they need, you know, they want people to share their stuff, share their stuff, tag them when you share their stuff, let them know how great you think they are. And, and that's how you start to get known as an expert. But, but, but here's the thing, if you do that from a LinkedIn profile, that's got, you know, dust bunnies on it, they're not going to know if you're credible enough. They're not going to know if they can use you because you haven't given them anything to show that you're worthy of them quoting you. They don't know you, right? So you've got to do this from a position of power. You got to create the brand for yourself first. Absolutely. And then so much about, like you said, having a conversation, expressing your expertise in an area because they don't know what they don't know. You know, you do it all day. And mm -hmm. PR isn't, hey, we have a new board member. We're going public. It's not, <laughs> it's not yeah. those things anymore. PR is anything that you have that helps somebody who doesn't understand what you do to understand it better, essentially. And if you can wrap your head around that, then it, it makes it so much easier to be able it's, to. It's that. exactly right. It's exactly right. And there's just, you know, I mean, if I if, if you're going to start with anything, start with your local newspapers, your local magazines and start to see who's writing articles about what you're expert in and start connecting with them on LinkedIn, sharing those articles, tagging them in those articles, letting them know that, you know, your stuff and maybe even adding your point of view. Right. Saying I love point three in this article and you talked about it like this. I like to describe it like that. Right. So you're kind of giving them your point of view. You're not contradicting them. You're just kind of like you know, letting them know you actually read it and that you've, you know, that you're credible and it's fun. It's fun to see how much of this you can get. And, and, you know, I've had people say to me, do you know how many pages you have on Google? Like, yeah, that's what I can do for you. You know, and it's not because I'm a P I don't have a PR agency. I don't even have a PR background. I know how to build relationships with journalists. Nice. Love that. So I know our listeners are going to want more from you. How do they start their journey with you? Well, I'm Karen Yankovich across all social media. Um, I have a free masterclass. If you go to karenyankovich.com slash masterclass, it kind of gives you a sense of the, the process that I teach when I help people with this. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know that you heard me here. Um, take a screenshot of this while you're listening and tag me in it so that, you know, Michelle and I know you listen to this and tell us what you like most of this. And it's another way. Again, this is how you start building relationships with the people you know, are you doing that with the podcast you listen to? Are you connecting with the hosts of those podcasts and sharing the shows and tagging them and letting them know you're sharing it? These are this is these are ways that you build your own credibility and you build relationships with some of the most powerful people in your industry. And we love it when you do that, by the way. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> we will have all of Karen's links in the show notes. Of course, peeps, just scroll down, go ahead and click on those while you continue to listen, of course. Because I get to ask you, Karen, at what point in life did you know that you were especially kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? Oh, you know what? I think I was born an entrepreneur. <laughs> and it's weird. My whole family is not. My family are all teachers and they all have pensions. But I was always like creating carnivals in my backyard and charging people for it. And, you know, um, and I, interestingly enough, now that I've got this little bit of woo in me, I was always the gypsy. I always wanted to be the fortune teller, you know, but uh, in those carnivals. But I feel like I, I always had this little like, you know, I can figure this out. And to be honest, one of the things that I, I like about what I do is people hire me to do this now. I find myself giving people advice all the time about their businesses and un, 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 like uninvited. Now I wait to be invited and, and it and it works out a lot better. I have a lot better, a lot more friendships that way when, I, when I'm not shoving my opinions down people's throats, but I'm letting well, them ask works. me for my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and I think it, I think it, I think, um, it takes a lot of guts to be an entrepreneur. So those of you that are listening, you know, kudos to you for doing this. Right. And speaking of the bravery that's required, oftentimes during somebody's entrepreneurial journey, they will have a blooper reel. Is there anything out of your blooper reel that you might be willing to share with us today? Oh, wow. There's a <laughs> lot of things on my blooper reel. Um, Oh my gosh. Some of the funner ones. There's gotta be good ones. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I did it when I was doing, this was actually kind of crazy, but fun. When I was initially doing my like social media thing, I was doing a webinar and 
somebody, and I was doing like how to make money with your business or some generic, ridiculous, generic webinar. And somebody challenged me because I've always been really interested in like, I, I have a Reiki master, I'm a dream coach. I have a lot of that stuff. So somebody challenged me and said, what if you did a workshop that said how to make money with your Reiki business? So I did. And man, the questions that I got and the arguments that I had about that, because people are like, oh no, I can't take money for this. I'm like, really? So you're going to go work at Macy's to pay your bills and not let the world know you had to give. So I had a lot of conversations around that, but I got to tell you something, you cannot, you cannot talk somebody out of their poverty consciousness if they're stuck in their ways with it. Right. But I tried for a long time. And then I'm like, I got to move on to people that, that understand that, you know, somebody's got to pay the bills keep the roof over their heads. But I remember there was, oh my gosh, the com the comments on my, on my ads and things like that were crazy. Um, I don't if care. If somebody was eavesdropping part, on that and going, Hey, you got some tenacity in it. That was a sparky answer. You want to come over here? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. And you know what? Like there's just been so many things. And you know what? Here's the thing too. I screw up. I screw up a lot. You know, I ran an ad for a while with a woman in a private jet, you know, and it wasn't me. I wasn't pretending to be in a private jet, but I was, I was talking about like making money and whatever. And I got a lot of people that didn't like that, but then there was a lot of people that did. Right. So you kind of have to go with pick it. your, <laughs> pick your battles and go with it. And for right. those of you who don't know, you know, I tend to live on the salty side of life, but we have other podcasts for that. But I think we're going to start honing in on that just a little bit more. Cause you know, that that's where the fun is. So peeps, Karen, you have been absolutely awesome. Do you have any last words for our peeps? You know what? Just, just own. If you need, if you need somebody to permission to to own what you do, call me. I'm happy to give you permission. Like just, just own it. Just think about your highest ticket item right now. <laughs> double it and put a big note on your wall and say, "What else can I do for somebody if I do?" Like just double whatever your highest ticket thing is in your mind, in your mind, and maybe on a big post-it note and play with that for a while and let me know how it goes. Love it. I love it. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Awesome. Peeps. That was fun. Thank you. That was <laughs> Peeps, this is Michelle and I'd like, thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to share with your friends and subscribe to the show. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Are you running a business over seven figures, but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention. You do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap. They offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.